<laughs> so do you know this song? Uh -huh. What's it called, yeah. Hansel? Love Ooh. Cats. All Me right. too. I know it. You know this one? <laughs> All right. So this is Love, love Cats. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty important song for him. It was a big hit. So I'm curious to see if you think it's a good song or not. I think you like it, Henson, right? Woo! This is cool. Right. I've watched this before. See no most of words. Hello out there, all you cats and kittens and kiddos and geezers. Welcome to the Holy Hour Podcast, the bi-weekly podcast devoted to the cure. I'm Gavin. Thanks so much for joining us today. We have a wonderful episode in store for you, and I uh, hope everyone's doing good out there. And uh, we're doing something a little different. We're stepping aside from the time frame. We've been uh, kind of dancing around 1992 era if you've been following along with Wish. And uh, we're going to backtrack a little bit and talk about the 1983 single, Love Cats. And uh, yeah, we got some cool conversation that I was able to capture. Um, I, I don't get to travel as much as I'd like, but I made it back up to Fredericksburg, Virginia to see my family and uh, hang out with my, my brother, Owen, in particular. We got recording of us talking about love cats my brother is a very good sport people don't know with podcasting it's, it can be a little weird as far as uh sitting down and recording conversation brother's a great talker and always willing to uh be a good sport but at the same time you know you're spending time with your family you're hanging out you're having a few drinks at a long day chasing kids around you know it's, you gotta feel it you know and you can't push it so i never want to uh push these recordings on people and especially not family members so we kind of just played it by ear each day would pass and we didn't quite get there and by the end of the week i was even letting just you know, like ah well if it's not meant to be it won't be but um he was a very good sport and suggested all right let's do this cure thing on the very last night so we were able to lock it down and uh and capture a, what i feel is a wonderful conversation about love cats my brother is an amazing man great father great big brother, um, just a class act and uh, a great talker, great bass player, a uh, great fan of music, great fan of pop music, has a great ear for pop music. So I thought this would be a perfect song to discuss with him and kind of also touches back to our and my origin story of The Cure and growing up and the first purchase involving a uh, Cure album. So, um, before we dive into our conversation, a um, couple disclaimers. It was the end of a very long but great week. Uh, so if he drinks in, a bit fatigued, um, squeaky chairs. I try to work around all that in the, in the post mix there, but uh, apologies in advance. And yeah, just a, a, another big thanks to Owen right on the top for uh, partaking in this experiment with me. He was, in fact, if you've been following along from the start of this show, a, uh, our first official guest. I think Donald and I recorded the first couple episodes together, and then I think around episode four, um, a very loose, probably completely different feel than current episodes of this show. I haven't really gone back and listened to many of them, but... Um, yeah, episode four, I talked with Owen. Uh, it was about the Smiths and the Cure and uh, kind of the pairing of the two. So if you like what Owen has to say, go back and listen to episode four. Wonderfully intelligent man, one of the smartest people I know, if not the smartest. Great historian. And um, yeah, so who who better to take back in time to 1983? So I don't want to babble on too much. Let's jump right into our conversation and uh, so this is me, my brother Owen, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Love cats. 
Uh, was our first official guest on the Holy Hour the podcast. First? Yeah, yeah, it's episode the four, I think it was. Smiths versus the Yeah, Marsh, you know? Owen and I uh, talked about the Smiths a lot, like to the point where it was like, it was more of a Smiths podcast. <laughs> sure. That's but, because uh, I'm his older brother. Yeah, he I just must. ran with it. You know, so you can't interrupt your older brother. You just got to go with it. So I was like here traveling, seeing family in Northern Virginia where I grew up for 30 years before I moved to Asheville. And oh. um, <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> I gotta come back and see your family. And uh, I was glad to. We're at the end of this long week. We're like, what night are we going to talk about the cure, Owen? Come on, man. Let's do this. Like, oh, uh, maybe tomorrow night. <laughs> it's like a um, almost famous kind of thing. <laughs> we're, we're at the end of the tour, man. We got to do this. But um, so I was trying to think of a good topic. And we thought we haven't done like a one off song episode in a while. And um, we thought a good good one would be to talk about love cats getting to the actual topic of this episode eight minutes in but uh <laughs> love cats is a good one and it's a weird one for us because usually we try to talk about um single songs before we do the album reviews and we have talked about japanese whispers with donald but as all diehard Kier fans know love cats was just a single japanese whispers was just a uh, collection of those singles so why not just address this awesome single that came out October 18th, 1983. So this is the part where we think back to our time machine of awesome. 1883. And, 1883? Um, 18, right? <laughs> well, I don't need to go that far back. <laughs> we'll go 1983. I just love like, history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Victorian version. He'll correct me on all the uh, wrong dates. <laughs> uh, so this yeah. was like when World War II was just wrapping up. Right, right. Okay, right. Come, when the come. Germans <laughs> bombed Pearl Harbor. Right, like right. That. that was the good stuff. Yeah. Right before 4th of July. Mm-hmm. But um, no, um, so yeah, this was uh, just to give some background on the song. We like to give a little context for uh, for for the listeners out there. But Love Cats, it's a one of the earliest, maybe the third in this batch of singles where the cure goes pop after pornography and and uh, the big fizzle out of pornography tour. They went super dark, got heavy, and that's kind of the context you take into these singles where you didn't really know what was the fate of the cure and robert was playing with Susie and the banshees so he kind of had a good solid gig that might have even just taken over at that point he didn't really want to continue the cure simon was out of the band um they put out two singles prior that year let's go to bed and the walk and even let's go to bed people are like whoa what is this super poppy shit which it's doesn't really seem that crazy it's the worst dance song of all time <laughs> yeah you're not a fan of yeah. let's go to bed no i love let's go to bed it's oh. just a terrible dance it's <laughs> just a dance too yeah, yeah, yeah. it's hard to dance based too. on lowell's dancing yeah. no just the whole concept <laughs> the whole of concept. let's go to bed <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm fully into it now <laughs> I, mean, I totally want to do that but awesome. it's the only dance i've ever been good at yeah sorry oh yeah so yeah we so digress let's go to bed. no it's all <laughs> it's all context because yeah it's weird to think that you know he was kind of putting out these singles in a way i mean there's been a billion back and forth like we talked about with with these songs of like how serious was he or did he just realize i can write good pop songs why not try for a hit at this point and you know got other projects going on doesn't even know if it's really the cure at that point it was just him and lol and um yeah so let's go to bed pretty good hit not a huge hit and the walk did well, but super poppy vein, kind of more synth pop again. And then this one comes out that uh, Love Cats, this jazzy pop, already shifting gears from boom, like. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> but, uh, but already shifting gears, which is weird to note that it isn't another synth, synth pop kind of, you know, song. No. It's a weird ass. It's just... an era of synth pop. Let's just blast out a jazz <laughs> yeah, dingle. <laughs> some kind of weird ass fucking alternative new wave jazzy pop yeah. song and and that's already another shift. So like going from you really do have to consider like seventeen seconds and then you got super dark with pornography, the band implodes, basically beat each other up and break up, you know. And that's then he's awesome. like cranks out a couple pop gems. And he's like, well, if it works, it works. You know, maybe if they flopped, that would have been the end of the cure. But it uh, turns out Love Cats makes it to number seven on the UK pop charts to date at this point. Between those, uh, what, three albums at that point and some singles, 
Your highest charting hit and gives Robert the taste that I do have it. I do have the power. <laughs> well, I could do this. Because <laughs> I think, I think, I think he like said it. He knew he could crank out some pop gems before that. People might like some like music. Fucking aha. I sing about cats. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so then he cranks out this weird ass pop jam yeah. and, um, you know. It's hard to say. It's weird. But it worked, and but people um, like cats. People <laughs> bought it because <laughs> people love cats. Yeah. And uh, I've yeah. been cats for a long time. It's just like totally turned you around. Yeah. So, yeah, we both were, grew Not up with cat. dogs in our family. Yeah, yeah. Song. Side note: That's what this cat. podcast is about. Cats. Yes. Like, are you, <laughs> you a like cat cats? person or a dog you person? Just delete this shit. But it from can your change. No, I think this is very important too because uh, you know people grow up. Both or yeah, dogs, no, we're, and we're going we're... sidetrack. You're doing great. So I <laughs> you. Uh, listen to a Donald episode. No, <laughs> that's, that's not good. <laughs> Love you, Donald. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the single comes out. The B sides. Do you uh, are you, you remember from the old cassette? Because that was our first purchase as kids too. We yeah. both went in. I probably said this somewhere way back early on. We like our friend Jeff Butler. I'll spare you of all the Jeff Butler. We got into him, then we're like, man, there's some good songs on there. So we actually went in halves on buying Standing on the Beach, the cassette. You shared that with him? Yeah. No, uh, me and you. Really? But yeah, we, we, we split whatever the hell money we had, uh, and we bought... the concept of money, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, or like whatever money our parents just gave us to buy the tape with. Right. But, um, but yeah, we were. but it was more of a statement of like... I like some, but I don't know if I fully want to commit to the no. whatever the price was at the time. And, um, like an and we bought it. I got into that. Yeah. yeah, and I remember one of the earliest standing on the beach memories from that was taking the cassette up to New Jersey to our grandparents' is pretty early on. And it was kind of the point where it dawned on us because we were like, yeah, Killian Arabs kick ass. And then we are like, Boys Don't Cry is awesome. And it was literally like the first album of like, where each song was just like, oh, now I like this one, because it would bleed into the next one, and then into the next one, and then yeah. into the next one. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, making it to Love Cats, I don't remember a distinct, like, first time hearing Love Cats, but just the fact that it didn't seem weird to me. I was just like, this whole band's just weird and fun. And, yeah. And it was just kind of in the middle with all those other, like, pop singles. And at this yeah. time, it was 88. It was uh, 87, yeah. 88. But, um... So yeah, I mean, I think on first listen, I loved it. Though, do you have any memory of first listen of well, Love Cats? I don't think that's any of those things. Back to what episode four of your podcast? <laughs> I think that all these things, when you start actually kind of channeling the sort of weirdness, always what was appealing to us is like guys from Virginia listening to the Cure, like this whole sort of you know variety and different spice. I mean something like caterpillar and it was awesome yeah. you were saying you know your son like totally loves caterpillar it's like this weird sort of alice in wonderland kind of version of a music and you're like whoa yeah. what is this kind of annoying as i get older like <laughs> but but the whole thing of just sort of a you know you're traveling through different sounds and space and that kind yeah. of thing i mean it didn't surprise me as, as I get older, like, you know, I always sort of chuckle, like, English folks, like, listening to English music, like, sort of their take on jazz or R&B is always fascinating to me. Yeah. Because they, they, they're much more open-minded. Not in England, it's all about class and, you know, structure and society. But they have, their, their racial concepts are totally different than what we listen to and take it. And I always sort of cringe when I hear English folks trying to do R&B and things. <laughs> and they kind of got it, you know, like, ah, and listen to some dude with makeup and a, you know, weird lol dude or whatever he was <laughs> around at the time. But they're doing the, you know, jazz, English people doing jazz. And it's yeah. like, uh, it's an American that's always sort of a little strange. Where I'm like, right. yeah, I don't know about this, but the you know, so much of the '80s is always the visual and yeah, them, it was clumping the, it all together. Yeah, and, um, yeah, yeah. And the idea, yeah, going into that vein of what we talked about with, um, yeah, like by saying it's the jazzy song, I'm sure Robert wouldn't even try to say this is a full on jazz number, but yeah, it's like definitely got the jazzy elements. Yeah, no, it's art. his best on impression. Yeah, you know, it's and, like and a, I, I, I'm I, sure he likes a lot of jazz and, you know, incorporating enough. The, Yeah, or enough. Yeah, maybe just I mean, he's gone on the record of like, making a lot of like 
Sinatra jokes even of like mm-hmm. you know where he's making a few too many where you know he loves it on some level but you yeah. know and it's like and I think it fits perfectly where that where he's like well let's see what we could do with this and I was like do with the brush drums and the and yeah and it's funny just thinking of like how this song probably came together like writing wise was it something I don't really know any history as far as like did they just like write it in the studio or if it was something that he had messed around yeah. with and no it's a fascinating one off of yeah and, and if it was ever meant but to be just always... a single that's a great one to just because it doesn't even fit on Japanese whispers like yeah. we were laughing about that when we did the episode one where it's all like as far as you know Japanese whispers is just a collection of the singles but at the same time they all really flow together because it was all those kind of more synthy ones. Let's go to bed, the walk, and right. upstairs room and stuff like that. But like, it still has weird shit, like you know, Mister Pink Eyes, or, or I guess that's yeah. not on there. But like, Speak My Language and uh, and Love Cats being the jazzy weird ones on a yeah. synth pop album, you know, or yeah. collection I mean, is still weird. But uh, that's still like the one question. Uh-huh. Like, would he start out the road this like because it is the one off? Right? Like, did he just like? get drunk one night and have fun like yeah let's just fucking write this one yeah. song but like but it, it kind of feels like one that you would just make in the studio like yeah, if everyone but, was kind of jamming and had like the if you were just one off stupid though it would suck yeah i mean we we did those for years where we joked around as musicians like let's make our shitty jimmy buffett song a red hot chili peppers dibba chimichanga yeah like it's the easiest kind of thing but no it's brilliant because he kind of has it now we uh, we talked about that earlier. Like I wonder how much of it was the studio influence of maybe having a musician on the thing that really was smooth with the bass and yeah. just kind of understood a basic bass concept. And Robert wanted the scat kind of over it, like yeah. he was Louis Armstrong kind of thing. And you know, Robert was just feeling happy Let's and likes his cats and yeah. like saw the potential of a funny thing that you know he kind of. I definitely always like get the feeling. I can say that as the neutral observer. I feel like I should uh-huh. be wearing a UN beret <laughs> right. thing of just in a funny way that you know the Robert would kind of have that tendency to kind of like I see a chance to stick an eye in the uh, take a stick and stick it in the eye of the average Cure fan yeah. of like whether it's Friday I'm in love or this it's yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of the hey all right well yeah I'm the goth guy you all want to dress like me oh, yeah. my makeup but here's one that'll blow your fucking mind yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's been like, like, like a reoccurring yeah. point for sure yeah, or just yeah. not so much even just like and, you know, at times it's been kind of deciphered in books or whatever is him sabotaging the band or whatever. I don't think it's anything like that, but I it's think he... more of a poking a stick in the yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. And, like, the idea more of, I think it's, like, shifting gears, like, when people expect something and he loves to fucking pull no, the rug out. always struck me as a yeah. mischievous dude. Yeah, yeah, and it's, like, like, and I think, it's I think, all think, coming off the hill, heels of, like, pornography, where it's, like, the darkest of dark, and that's yeah. why I did Let's Go to Bed, because then it's like, ah, oh, check this out. Or even... And the then this of, is, like, a comp, like, pulling the rug out of, like, all yeah. right, where we're not even a synth pop band, were or even jazz. off of like wish off of disintegration yeah. in that sense of like you know Friday I'm in love and those kind of oh, songs yeah, yeah. coming yeah. after like I wrote my darkest album oh, and yeah, for sure. you know, like, you know, brilliant uh, let's uh, get happy uh, let's get spooky yeah. but, and I've I've been more more convinced that you know he he saw he's not an idiot and yeah. if you all like step back as Cure fans and look at the thing from a distance that you know he he was obsessed I think with a certain sense and Robert's way too talented to want to be pigeonholed as the Bauhaus guy right. or, or you know any of those things and there's all that whole thing that's like I think it's a forgotten darker cycle of that era you have the Ministry and the Nine Inch Nails yeah. and all those there's the thing and they've sort of just like they're like that weird Jurassic layer of archaeology that have sort of died and, <laughs> and I like always fought against them as a kid who liked to cure in that era of like where the hell did that even go the fact that like industrial music is just like yeah. it's like the Neanderthal chain of the human chrome <laughs> so it's like where the hell but I kind of like it humorously yeah, yeah. and as a cure fan and like somebody like later like ah man every once in a while you kind of like everyone needs a little Trent Reznor yeah yeah god it's horrible I'd like come back in time and smack myself for saying that yeah I definitely like it more now than I ever did back then but you know it's a guy that grew up we we, you know a little background I'm not like you know the dude the thing was uh, you know we, we grew up going to Washington D.C. and we had this awesome nightclub tracks 
that was like uh, it was a gay club that basically catered to kind of gay guys in DC and in Southeast DC mm-hmm. down by the Navy Yard, but they would always dabble in sort of the '80s culture and '90s culture, and it went from industrial music and goth and rave culture and things. And yeah. to see that those things were all sort of synonymous in the area of that sort of dark and spooky, and yeah. you know that we can all kind of giggle at Depeche Mode or you know and differentiate between New Order and things at the times, but it was much more in that little weird, tight universe yeah. of that. So, you know, th- t- if you listen to Love Cats today and you're like a young person, you're like, oh, whatever, it's a guy that likes cats and it's a jazz. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. nah, it's like you have to like go listen to like Depeche Mode for a few minutes and Nine Inch Nails and yeah. the Ministry and all that crap. And here's this dude that like red lipstick and weird and in between singing about caterpillars and death and things, <laughs> he suddenly spouts this jazzy yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a like, huge yeah. point. It's yeah. like, don't underestimate the weirdness of Love Cats and, yeah. and, and all of Robert Smith's But the stuff. fact that it's sort of a throwaway, it could be like the so what of Boys right, Don't right. Cry, like, you know, he sings a cake rapper song, and yeah, we're yeah. not doing a podcast about that song. Not yet. There's no one likes what? cake rappers as much as cats. I mean, I've yeah, learned yeah. that with my wife, but never of those goddamn cats. 80 more episodes will do so what. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I love cats, man. It's like... <laughs> 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 But so what? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it is it's so weird and like just that it's such a weird fucking pop song coming from them and in that time and in that era, you know, like you said, it just gets kind of washed over now when you look at their whole category because yeah, sometimes they have these goopy pop songs and they, but I mean, at the time, it is something. And uh, going back to what we said with the studio recording too with Phil Thornley was, you know, producing this and played bass on it. We even looked it up. We're all like, "Well, technically, was he playing upright bass?" And like, yeah. and he is credited on the sleeve, is what we eventually went to because it was like, you know, when they play it live, you know, Simon always plays a regular bass and it sounds yeah. fine. And we're at yeah. eighty studio production. We really kid? could because you just like do assume from the video and from the little in between. This is my like full disclosure point uh-huh. as a musician and a uh-huh. bass musician playing <laughs> with Gavin for years. I bought an upright bass <laughs> purely because of the song. Like, I had to play the song. It was something as a bass player, like, if I couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it on an electrical instrument. It was just like any idiot could play it on an electrical instrument. <laughs> I had to play it just like the cure on my upright bass and a double bass if you have to look yeah, it up. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and <laughs> Whatever you want to call which it. Which <laughs> I, I bought and I did it and I loved it. And then I learned there's a reason why people don't play double bass or upright right. bass it's a pain in the ass it's like really difficult <laughs> but but that's a whole different episode yeah, yeah, of like, yeah. i'll tell you how much i hate the stray cats and later strangely though. enough for the cure listeners out there if anyone knows of any footage or just witness account i don't think they've even version. like back then yeah, yeah did they ever try it live I'm no pretty sure it's and for no, people who don't you know, I'm sure just, Simon never did it, but uh, even like during the top. And if tour, you're, but right. the funnier thing too is if you're a musician or you're not a musician, more importantly, and you listen to the bass uh, as a bass musician, there's technically different aspects. You have your electric bass and you have your upright bass, which is sort of the Stray Cats thing or whatever rockability that you think about, and that's sort of what we think about with Love Cats, you know, more of a jazzy yeah. somewhere meets it. But there's also an instrument called the the fretless bass, mm-hmm. which is sort of this weird hybrid of the whole thing. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and then that's I, mean, I use that in the studio when imitating a double bass, and you can play fretless. And I mean, basically, there's no little rungs between the notes, and you can yeah, slide to it. Way. And sort of it's an imitation of the upright and it's much easier to play in a simple sense in the studio setting and stuff so mm-hmm. I mean the, the whole mystery of it is you know you want to think you're in this mean? Harlem jazz club <laughs> with Robert dancing around with his mortified stuffed cat you know I don't think this if Simon had been in the band it would have been interesting to hear like yeah. what if he would have like just gone with Robert and done what he does now for live shows or would he have just written or yeah. tried to convince nah, him to play a different it doesn't seem like Simon kind no, of stuff nah I'm always kind of so it's cool that he's that sense that... he just plays it maybe that's why they don't play it that much live you know <laughs> it's just kind of like right. not that he can't but you know because obviously he can but it's just like it's yeah. like a little it's not the hijack, I wonder the if podcast you like, in that sense is uh, no. one thing for everyone to look into if you have no concept of like how much that 
there's it's the third wheel of the band. The, the band is there, the musicians are there, and everybody's writing these things, and the songwriter and the musicians and all that. But the producer is just fascinating. And anything, if you care at all about music, you know, to buy those books and read the history of albums and things, you know, it's that guy you happen to be recording with. That mm-hmm. it really is that guy. It's the sound man. That's your always your member of the band that you don't know but like on a magical level that producer really fascinating way shapes it and you know and and whether or not robert that's that's the billion dollar pyramid alien astronaut theory question of whether it was the producer who wrote it or or just like was really he might have recorded a jazz band before that he'd been really into that shit he might have had the cut of it or whatever but he's just like hey robert i was doing this and you don't want to take a take Or, or or robert heard it and was like totally i just I got high one night and drunk one night yeah. and I just want to do this. But how much a producer can influence the sort of take on something like, let's take this in a fun way. Yeah, and and you the, the difference of it, you know, always too, is if you're not a mu- musician and it's never like to judge those folks, it's like when you're in the studio, it's the difference between the artist just picking up a brush and painting something, but you don't really, you know, folks are always purist about it, like, ah, they shouldn't play with it too much, or they shouldn't do it too much. But when you go in the studio, the whole idea of all these tools that are there, it's like, it's like going into the artist's shop and suddenly having everything. And you can, we're all sort of, as music fans, like, everybody should sound, you know, live, should be the same, it should be pure. But when you go in the studio, the whole reality of it is, it's like, sometimes... You've got all these crayons in the spikes and these pastels in the spikes yeah. and you know, and the art is like not overdoing it but finding that happy medium and I yeah. think something like this kind of thing could have just kind of organically popped out and just it's such a bizarre yeah. one off kind of thing. And where, it's cool because and then even like cure history wise to note that it's kind of the one of the first that branch out in a kooky way that they do tend to do from here on. Like there hadn't been much of that leading up to this. But, you know, by having this weird jazzy one, then later, especially by even shortly after this with the top, you start getting into more kind of worldly stuff. You know, there's a few songs, even like Caterpillar gets weird as hell, like as far as like having more like bongos and weird yeah. strings and shit. And then like leading up to like the 13th or something that has like, you know, just full, not even songs that they can or do justice recreating live very often like you're saying it's yeah. like it's more about you just get in I've the studio and you kind of take that, that album. well when we were in the studio though it was a disintegration had like the thing where they used like 48 tracks or something like where they just maxed out the tracks yeah, yeah and i forget i mean all of them probably pretty yeah, much from that no on but the cure like seemed to take pride in oh, that yeah, like especially it, from i'm a big reggae and up. like more yeah, basic yeah. fan of like how they mix things down and do things i think robert kind of is definitely i mean the, the the funny thing is is the cures the band the sort of dodecahedron weirdness of that it's robert he's like such a weird dude yeah, yeah. and totally wants to sit in his basement and like make these things and he has these awesome friends that they've stuck around that he's <laughs> able to keep the band concept yeah, and, and yeah. Do it. yeah. I mean, it's not like you're gonna hear I, i'm totally looking forward to that the whole idea for robert smith you know, like acoustic four track where he's just like right. high. And you but I'm sure get Mary's those with like the demos to release that when he's dead. Yeah, man. So like, These are the songs Robert sang when he was fucked up in his basement. Yeah. And well, I mean, that's yeah. kind of what the on the deluxe ones. I don't know if you heard too much yeah. of those. Like the reissues, they do have a lot of the demos, and they're, uh-huh. they're cool because they're there's still at least like thirteen tracks. Of, yeah, at least <laughs> they're still like overly <laughs> elaborate. But no, like most of the early ones, like for like Let's head on the see. door and stuff. They're cool because you do hear the basic all the parts concept. and like just on like a four track and right. they're just like rough or have like a little drum machine going before the forty eight layers of mixed yeah up and it's and kind of sweet and cool to hear just like okay but this the was the idea one of those, and then he just yeah. cakes it on but I mean that's kind of what they're like top five huge yeah. awesomeness is because no. they layer everything but that's, so good. And the you Cure, know, and like, God bless them. That's, you know, I am a real Cure fan despite my blue beret that I'm joking about. <laughs> I was like, I don't, they're one of the few bands I don't want to hear that shit. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to hear Robert Smith in his, ba- you know, sitting on the bed dicking around with his acoustic. Oh, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. Would, no, I mean, well, it's a, it would be <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Gavin doesn't get out much, <laughs> but, but uh, from a musical concept, I don't find it that fascinating. Yeah. I'd rather hear Peter Tosh do that, but like yeah, yeah. the whole idea of Robert, this 
No, he's he's beautiful and it's orchestral and it's fascinating the idea that you the more you have of the thing yeah. it more it adds and it's orchestral and yeah. you know if you're an idiot if you don't really appreciate the beauty of something like disintegration where yeah. you have all those like crazy layers yeah, and, that's, and that's like the only <laughs> album I've ever heard that where it was like you know every well, little part is like oh fuck that well, could be a song and it's, it's fascinating so. how many albums is anybody out there who's listening to this like scene where there's a disclaimer in the thing which is dating you to being older <laughs> because you don't get a disclaimer in iTunes you just know like open CD booklet right. but in the CD booklet for disintegration it's like play it loud yeah. and you have to play it loud in your car preferably not your shitty house stereo or whatever, to like <laughs> really like open and uh, all those things so it's just like whoa like you yeah. to get those tracks and like the deepness and the little dings and yeah, the bells you hear and something the thing. different every yeah. time yeah so it's... i mean that's the whole thing that's so beautiful about the cure and that's the, i mean and even you know, going back to love gets it's like there's some crazy cool little shit going on this i mean there's like little weird cat noises just yeah. vocally yeah. this is kind of where he's starting to do that more but in a funny way and i like, see this is like a, yeah, it's like a stepping stone strip to... down of the oh bell. yeah and it's mean, like it's still it's early like, on but this right. is like yeah. where the first branch is leading yeah, out yeah, to like close to me but there to me it shows how much those, like the cures you know? a pure studio pros yeah, yeah they're not they're not you know rastafarians doing this they're not yeah, even folk this early musicians. on yeah like no, no, he knows what he's doing and and robert's a studio rat in the most positive ways to say it and yeah. it's a sort of a, and he's got very very talented people around him and he's willing to listen to them and it's not ego driven and yeah. you know so no it's beautiful it's it's like fun, you know, that he's willing to, I think, you know, hell, we could end the podcast here if you have to be. <laughs> he's willing to go into a studio and have fun and use the art kit that's in front of him to play mm-hmm. the most interesting. I'm not afraid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really how's this going to look or how's this going to be silly? And he could have thrown it away, but it was it was fun and cool. And it, in one point, it was great. And he wasn't, like, influenced in stupid ways. He didn't turn it into, like, an Eric B. and Rakim number. He didn't try yeah. to rap or act like he's cool we did. Right. robert's always sweet and awesome in the sense that he's willing to kind of poke fun of himself yeah. and, you know so if robert's gonna be cool he's gonna sing about cats and right, you know, right. and, and it's still yeah. gonna just be weird and not really make all that much yeah, sense no, but man, i i, I, think I love like looking up and, like it's always fun to look up the lyrical interpretations too because it's all like people are like clearly it's a about a suicide pact based off of this that's a dark song about being thrown into the sea <laughs> with a cat. I'm just like, yeah, but I mean, it's just... You really little... hate your girlfriend's yeah, cat if you're coming up with like, that I think it's just a fucking fun love song about like being two crazy cats that are falling in love you know to be honest, what I'm I mean you know, if, I, if I had Robert tied to a chair and just burning him with cigarettes, I would be like, this is... To admit it, man, you yeah. totally wrote this because you like fucking cats, and it was fun, and you were into like you know whatever at the time, and yeah, it was yeah. just like the shit just came together real quick. Yeah. I don't imagine they spent weeks on this and were like, yeah. "No, man, lyrical, you got it wrong." Yeah, I want it. Yeah. I want it more orange. It's yeah, more, right. you know, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's fucking it's great because cranked it's, out. Yeah, I've had kind of gone down the lyrical idea, and it's like ah, that's silly to even pick apart the lyrics. I challenge stuff. everyone. Like, put like come up their best cat playlist in the comments ooh, section. Yeah. Of like what other, other great song. cats? Songs. Yeah, not not including not like cats, the musical but or or counting kind of tigers and lions song. like Katy Perry. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, that's my daughter's <laughs> no, thing. Uh-huh. Lions versus tigers. That's okay. an epic battle. That like oh, I don't know. songs about lions and tigers. No, just the whole fucking or genre. Just <laughs> of, <laughs> she even hates tiger lilies. She wants my wife to plant like lion lilies, but they don't wow. exist. But we're gonna tell her some of them are lion <laughs> lilies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nice. But, uh, yeah, it's. A, yeah, I would like to hear a cat cats. playlist. Oh, yeah, it's not to, many. So it's like a little ten. There's got to be tons of cat songs. <laughs> cat Stevens song. <laughs> Sweetie Cat Stevens. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of qualifiers. I don't, don't want to like spend the whole night, but I'll uh, get back to you. I'll come up. I love making a mix. So, uh, all right, all right. But, um, Challenge you all with your okay, best yeah. five cat songs. In, in Facebook, your favorite cat songs, and then we'll <laughs> compile them all for a Spotify playlist or something. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, a, it's a fun, cool song. And a couple of things we wanted to touch on too is. Um, and we didn't quite confirm it, but um, going back to um, 
my brother and I started skateboarding around the same time we got into the cure in 87, 88 was like kind of our peak skateboarding years. And, and we, I remembered, and I wanted to hit you up with this question. I think it would be some big like nuclear thing, but you're kind of like, I'm not sure either. But Rodney Mullen, my brother here, Owen did freestyle skating a lot. And in the early days, if anyone's familiar with like Parewell and Darren, <laughs> Rodney Mullen. Weird Mullins before and shit. weird was yeah, cool. Yeah. And I was all like, no nah, man, I just want to fucking do some ramps want to freestyle. And do some shit, you know? And, uh, so yeah, he was the big freestyle guy, and I clearly remember uh, one competition. It wasn't like an official release tape or something out there, but some skate thing. And uh, either, and we couldn't. We think it's either Rodney Mullen or Per there because those are the only two that anyone really cared about. <laughs> but um, you hear that, uh, Matt Warnsman? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what's the other dude from France? Who was a Pierre Andre. Pierre Andre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's a cool mass too. Favorite, but no, no one gave a shit nah. about that dude. <laughs> but um, uh, but anyway, to his routine, they would play like songs, and Love Cats was one of them. Well, I remember we were already. If you familiar. aren't familiar with freestyle skateboarding, it was kind of less aggro and sweaty armpits than the yeah. traditional Tony Hawk thing that you might be familiar with, and. Basically, it was like ice skating yeah. with a skate, it was more like a, a little dance narrow skate. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody I knew as a kid made fun of me because I <laughs> did this on a giant piece of flat concrete because we lived in rural Virginia and didn't have any ability to like build ramps. Sort of an idiot up the Amazing hill that his dad who thought he could do it. Yeah, <laughs> um, but the idea was that you sort of did this and you you sort of picked it. But from my experience, the most fascinating thing with these freestyle skateboards because you like like an ice skater almost you pick cool things and being a skateboarder you were always alternative these dudes had like awesome taste and you know they wouldn't just pick your average thrash metal or black flag song or whatever that would do it they would look for cool things that sort of express themselves and that's the neat thing where you know it popped up whether it was the clash or you know other bands it was the cure you know different people even trying to research it was like well maybe we can find it real quick and like just on first scratch of the surface we found like Parawellander had like Depeche Mode and what was the other one? It was like Depeche Mode and um, uh, something Clash, else. Thompson was, Twins. I mean, it was all like yeah. good for the time. In Excess was a oh, big yeah, one Excess before they really sucked. And, yeah. and it was just sort of, you know, like, <laughs> no, but these guys thought it through and that was the cool thing. And the, you know, the, the fact that Love Cats kind of popped up in yeah. one of those random things. For I remember sure. that not being like the first time we heard it by any means, but we were just kind of more reassurance that it was no, like, but oh, it, yeah, it, these, it, cool. it, to me anyway, I was like, well, if it's cool enough for those dudes. And it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> alternative way it appealed to people outside the, yeah. the sort of norm, you know, and that kind of, you know, reinvigorated. I mean, Robert Smith didn't write, you know, Love Cats to appeal to a jazz Skate. crowd. <laughs> I skateboarders. Mean, <laughs> no, but it was that sort of, I mean, the beautiful yeah, aspect Yeah, maybe of, more so skateboarders than jazz crowd, probably. But. Yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> but it's a beautiful part about the 80s where you could do something like that and appeal to something well outside of the norm i mean yeah. i always find and, and it's like we're old dudes i'm 44 years old and i'm not i'm old as hell but like i'm not the same <laughs> not thing that old, right? <laughs> i'm like an 80 year old and a 44 year old oh, but i mean the whole aspect of the 80s that was beautiful and all you people I give a fist bump to out there that give a crap to say the same it's that sort of arrow i mean the fact that you could have a black flag and you know Violent Femmes, B-52s, you know, the, the Cure playing Love Cats and their weird dicked up jazz. I mean, it's right. like, you know, people are open-minded enough and it's not a political thing or a left-righter thing or whatever. Yeah. It's just like that it was an era where people were open to listening to different things and it was cool. You got the Red Hot Chili Peppers wearing their dumb construction paper hats doing yeah. heroin and everyone was <laughs> like, wow, those dudes are cool, but it didn't come into class warfare. It was kind of nice, you know, yeah. and, you know, not overproduced, you know, American Idol kind of weird thing. We were not so locked into what, you know, the, frankly, the more weird variation that you had. Yeah, it was, it was almost like, you had to be weird. You know, I mean, it was a time when even <laughs> Germans could be famous <laughs> in the radio. <laughs> Falco and yeah, Falco men good. without hats dancing through Renaissance Falco festivals. A, like, yeah, God yeah. bless the 80s, man. And they weren't even at mid-80s at this point. This was still early Yeah, that's 80s, even more bomb. So. With it, crazy like, how like timeless yeah. this song is in yeah. a sense they're competing like, with the cartoons and yeah. like, well actually this is a good segue uh, we don't do this much in this show because it's a little 
would have been an easy out, but fun to always consider with Cure songs and stuff. Because I always love talking about how timeless these songs are. You really can just play this song anytime, and nobody would probably be able to pinpoint fucking what year it came out if you played it for them. So I was like, well, let's get a quick little list of like the week that <laughs> Love Cats wow. fucking broke in number seven on the UK chart. What was which is always better than what the was on the chart. chart? Yeah, and it was funny though because when I looked it up. I was like, well, I looked it up the week that it was released, and there was like tons of cool shit on the UK one. Like, like I was like, oh, what a golden era! Like you were talking, it was like like Blue Monday and shit was yeah. still lingering. I think it had been yeah. like fading no, but out. Alternative and, stuff and doesn't crack it. Yeah. And it's still best, but by this week when it finally came out, I was it was like all of these songs because this is and strangely enough, it, it's November thirteenth. Which is my brother's birthday. Yeah. Right here. The week that it finally hit its highest peak of number seven on the because UK chart. Because I am a bass baby. And that was right? how this whole podcast was based on My whole well. life is about the bass. <laughs> not, not, not the fat chick that sings about that. But I, I, <laughs> so uh, I thought too. it'd be fun to run down the UK songs that like uh, paired up with it on the uh top billboard chart the week that it peaked at <laughs> number awesome. seven Safety and then compare it to the U- <laughs> u.s charts too so yeah like counting down number eight i just did a little bit i didn't do the full 10 so, oh maybe i did yeah, yeah number 10 was some song called never never that i never even that's heard some of, weird so, shit yeah. that english people like but never never, never we never, could throw never number 10 out that probably, was like, if we yeah. heard it we'd probably be like oh it's like song. never never <laughs> and they're like yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right, I don't so know. Karma um, Chameleon, we're not going to yeah, sing that for you. <laughs> yeah, that was fading out, so it had been clearly on number one forever, and it was on its way back down the chart now, Karma Chameleon. Fucking safety Dance. Safety Dance, dance Men Without Hats. A song that kept song. Renaissance festivals yeah. like relevant for years. <laughs> and, um, Be nice to small people. Yeah. That, guy that guy in totally the band? Racially... Did we no, hear... no, he hired just him. Just for the video? Yeah, that in the blonde. Well, the blonde was probably Is anybody in the band? In the band? <laughs> I don't care. No one cared Did after that song. Did they ever have song. another song? No one cares. Uh, I'm sure they got... We might have joined the Russian army to avoid yeah. cheering for that band. <laughs> <laughs> so safety dance is number eight. So then number seven, the cure, love cats. That's Yay! where jazz will get you in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> highest charting song ever. Which I'm sure kind of pissed Robert Smith off. He's like, really? This is yeah, the one he dicked Even around in like, the boys studio. Boys don't cry. No, nothing. No, <laughs> All right, no, no, no. forest. No, the one nothing. we did is a laugh Primary, in the studio. No, let's, have, no. let's have a laugh. <laughs> yeah, let's buy this jazz thing. Um, be, oh, wonderful. And then yeah, strangely enough, another cat song is number six. Mm-hmm. Adam. Are you Ant. sure it's about Puss in Boots? <laughs> <laughs> With Adam Ant, you What's never this know. Podcast <laughs> Puss Cat going to London. I love uh, that song growing up. Doesn't really hold up so much these days. Uh, this is up. a differentiating between the um, Cotter brothers. Gavin fell for idiot. It would make up on love that. Adam Ant. Where yeah, a it's rim, like colonial suit. And shit. I've never heard of the next one though. <laughs> Madness. Yeah, well, that song, but yeah, uh, that's Sun and Rain. Yeah, I, our maybe house. If I heard it, but yeah, we, must we, have been the B side to our house. Yeah, yeah, we don't know too many. I wear tweed hats those, for but. a living, and I don't care. And then it gets kind of ridiculous quick. It's like number four, Lionel Richie, all night long, all night. And then another one. I've, I don't <laughs> think I know this. That. All night, <laughs> uh, oh, sh- la, la. Shaken Steven. Ah, oh, Christ, you know that's that? our UK. Well, that's back to the weird shit of the UK. Yeah, Sorry. Oh, that, is that the crowd? Just a little bit. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I kind of. Up, but I might be mixing it up with another. Yeah, thing. no, I think you might have it. Yeah. It's kind of like that other Some guy that was all like, over for OMD with the. Uh, God, yeah, yeah, Howard uh, Jones. Yeah, 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 one of those kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, like as soon as you hear it, you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. I know the song, but I would never name that fucking guy's name <laughs> right. in the entire He's planet. Stevens. So fuck you, Shake It Stevens. Uh, I know your song, but no one cares about your name there. Well, do uh, these two sound familiar? Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson? Never heard of them. <laughs> say, 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 oh, what you know Was that the B side of the Karma <laughs> Chameleon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's but that Paul goes McCartney? back to our. Um, what? Who's Paul McCartney? He's that one that's uh, in the, like a band called the Beatles. Dude, this is a Cure podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
and topping it all off is my man oh, Billy Joel. Fuck that guy taking over the UK with a little proving once and for all that everyone in the world and particular. World. Yeah, and proving once more than everyone doesn't realize how annoying New York City is. Uh, like, wow, that's what New York. Yeah. That's what New York. If is I had a piano and coke, this was the song <laughs> that I fucking wanted to listen to. The uh, when she and here's a little here's a little spoiler for you. She dumps him uh, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> not, well, not it was kind of inevitable. But, with that lineup in mind, how brutal is the U.S. <laughs> if you haven't fast forwarded past yeah. this. <laughs> Let's just start off by saying that Love Cats isn't anywhere on the fucking top 1,000 in the U.S. Uh-huh. charts. No Cure song will ever come close to the U.S. charts until probably, like, uh, maybe in the <laughs> top 40. I and don't know. I don't want to be the spoiler here, but there's a song with Cum, see you yep. in the title, and it just, that preempts the Cure in their jazz. It happens to be the brilliant. exact position that the Cure held. Yeah, Number so, seven is my boy's quiet right with Come on. Yeah, so all you assholes from New Jersey <laughs> that participated in that and why you think it's sort of quaint and funny today. Oh, that's not kicks ass. Let's be like, come on, baby. Yeah, they're fucking horrible. And fuck you guys. And, you know. Fix? I fought with song. you people on the this school bus. This was one bus. that was like f- fading out. Yeah, yeah one know. thing is that Fix was an the MCA run, though, right? One thing to another. Yeah, we had um, yeah, the Fuck beach. you guys. Well, you love the Fix because my grandfather worked for MCA We got free a uh, promotional gifts. Yeah, we got beach balls from the <laughs> it fix. It said, like, the fix on it. Yeah, the fix, and it was, like, something about the beach, head Man. to the beach or something, so... Bonnie yeah, Tyler came in with Betty, Betty Davis. Davis so I think it was fading down from the top. And she of wasn't the other chick that actually everyone thought sang Betty Davis. Um, uh, Bonnie Raitt? No. <laughs> Damn, I'm drunk now. Um, uh, uh, Betty Davis. Uh, there was another Betty Davis? It wasn't actual Betty Davis? Uh, some <laughs> bitch with a raspy voice that sang, like, annoyingly. Uh, that was like, uh, oh, Total Eclipse of the Heart? Yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was that? Carney something. Oh, so it's like all those shitty yeah. chicks. So maybe Bonnie Tyler. Uh, whatever. It's awful. Oh, no, she's the raspy. She's got Betty Davis. Davis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, if you're younger than us, be thankful you didn't have to fucking listen to it. That's yeah. brilliant. Uh, say, 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 say Paul man. McCartney. And all the people who are yeah. older than us, fuck you for keeping Paul McCartney around at this oh, point. That's, oh, like, that's not beautiful. That's a terrible song. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, you hippie. <laughs> Right. Billy uh, and Joel kind of still sucks as number three. Yeah. Kenny and Dolly. Who the fuck is listening to Island, Island in the stream? Jesus Christ. And Lionel Richie coming in an all night long top USA. Bringing it home, my boy. Like, I'm thankful I didn't hold a job in like national security in the 1980s because I might have sold all our secrets yeah. to the Russians. And you should be thankful you referenced our uh, grandpa that worked for MCA Promotions and like these are all his boys like on the yeah. top like Lionel Richie. And so I might have financially that. benefited from all your <laughs> shitty music days at this or at era, least man. a hell of a lot of Christmas yeah. presents well maybe what we could see him <laughs> bringing this back to the cure is uh, that you know we lived in a time where people were open minded enough mm-hmm. to be stupid yeah, and listen yeah. to any shit you put out. It just, and, and, yeah, it uh, did dawn on me like while well, I was like, well, clearly everyone's like, but that's back Billy to, Joel's like all uh, fucking doing. No, but doo-wop back to what I'm saying shit, is, do I pop? Always then, have to, like, and I am a real historian. <laughs> I do get paid <laughs> for it, believe it or not. It or not <laughs> when I'm not doing podcast <laughs> drunk on my patio with my brother, uh, I, I do this. I know a little bit about the history and just the yeah. whole concept of like fascinating. Yeah have to look at it from the time period and not be so judgmental and that's the amazing thing yeah. of this and like appreciating something like love cats of like how you could think out the box in this era and do something it wasn't you know i think today too often young musicians would try to do something like you know i want to be that and they would basically set out to make every album like disintegration and the fact mm-hmm. is there's one disintegration album and there's lots of other there's things one and, song and you're free, yeah, and you have time <laughs> to do, i mean to be fair back then they had time to develop and do different styles and things but we're in a whole new era of music and you know everything single oriented and i yeah. see so little of people taking chances and doing something fun yeah it and, should and, be and, more and, like this yeah, really because no people don't have to do the, a concept yeah, yeah. album or whatever it's not like you're going to make an eight million dollar video with helicopters and black choirs yeah. and you know so i mean it's just sort and of they did kind of pair it up i mean speak my language and mr pink eyes were kind of like weird new wave jazz too but it was all that single those were the b-sides you know yeah. like 
But it in left England, it at that. That's like, an they didn't thing try too. to stretch any of that into the next album. Right. It was already done. But it's also an interesting thing to point it. out from my old man deep recesses of music history and knowledge. I mean, it's a, the English have always been oriented to the concept of the single much more than any of an uh, American yeah. audience. Like, we don't have the weekly singles. You know, they were sort of ahead of the iTunes world in that sense, yeah, yeah. you know. I mean, it, it's really hard and fascinating to sort of relate that. Like, you know, yeah. basically you pop these things out and you did them and, you know, it'd eventually end up on your ladder than bombs or standing yeah, on the yeah. beach, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, where you put out a compilation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, just, yeah, it is so strange in the sense of, like... Random one-off song that yeah. just, like... Appreciate that moment in time. And yeah, yeah. Well worth the podcast. Oh, <laughs> thanks for hanging in there with me, man. I know it's nobody ever wants to sit down and talk about The Cure, even if they're a Cure fan at the time. They're like, what? Can well, this turn? It goes on and on. But uh, thank you, good people out there. And if you have any thoughts on Love Cats or The Cure or Jazz or pop, New Wave Jazz or the charts in 1983, feel free to uh, chime in. We'd love to hear your opinions and uh can't thank you enough, Owen, our original first ever guest, come <laughs> back again. Yay! And uh, maybe uh, we'll have you back again. Big ups to pretty. all the Cure world out uh, there. <laughs> I like to laugh at Donald as much as you. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Owen. Love you. Thanks for being a part of the show and uh, coming back on the show. And hopefully get to talk some cure with you again soon, as soon as I can come up with another topic that you would be into. But, uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And, you know, a semi-divisive song. We didn't really get to go into that, but I think just the idea of pop cure versus dark cure is a lesson that we've learned through the course of doing this podcast and uh, – and any of the poppier numbers, uh, especially the ones that have more success, are going to uh, kind of have a perspective from both sides of the fence when it comes to The Cure. So I didn't want to wrap up the episode without reading a couple comments that we got from listeners that, uh, in fact, do split the perspective here. And uh, first we hear from Jonathan, uh, who we've heard from in past episodes. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks again for writing. And uh, he writes, hey, once again, I'm bringing the negative approach here. Wait until Wish. I'll be singing its praises then. But I really don't like Love Cats at all. It's just far too poppy for my taste. It's not so much the song itself that rubs me the wrong way, but more my past with it. Many times at parties and gatherings, I've brought up The Cure and the common response is, oh, I love The Cure. I have the greatest hits album and Love Cats is their best song. So as you may be able to tell, this upsets me greatly. I feel uh, if I had to give it some credit, I'd have to say that it has a great bass line, though. So yeah, um, I think anybody in that plays the bass in particular can't really argue that awesome bass line that we discussed um but uh yeah it is a pretty rad bass line and uh yeah way to but i think that's a lot of the uh critiques with the pop songs it's not even so much the song it's just that it's kind of an unfair representation of what the cure is really all about but at this point maybe you know they've got so many poppy songs that maybe it isn't totally unfair that they are perceived as this poppy weirdo band like that and not the darker stuff so i mean it really is cool but uh i could see i think that's a lot of people's uh problem with the pop songs is you know the success and the people that get to know them through that and only stick to that but then you have people like dub vulture who wrote in on our instagram account and um he wrote, this is the first song I remember hearing by The Cure. I was taping a college radio show, and Love Cats was one of the songs to be played. Some of the others on the tape were Ode to Boy by Yazoo, My Kingdom by Echo and the Bunnymen, I Want to Be Sedated by The Ramones, and What Difference Does It Make by The Smiths. Um, I was instantly in love with The Cure, though, and I had never heard anything quite like it. Luckily, I had a friend who already knew all about them and was kind enough to tape Japanese Whispers and Boys Don't Cry, the album, for me. That was in 1984, and I've been a fan ever since, and I will never get sick of Love Cats. So there you go. Um, a perfect example of how the pop ones pull you in, and I'm definitely more in that that boat there where, uh, you know, I love the dark stuff, I love the poppiest stuff, but uh, the pop 
is what brings you in, that hooks you, gets you to bite the hook. And the next thing you know, you're a fan for life. So who knows? And uh, I guess it's all worth it, no matter what perspective in that regards. And man, I can't imagine. I'm so jealous. 1984 had been so cool to have followed him for just those few extra years, even before I got into him, and just to see these directions unfold and, and their careers build that much more. That would be pretty rad. So I'm jealous there, Dub Vulture. And uh, thanks so much for writing in and sharing your thoughts. As always, good to hear from you. And uh, and John, too. Thank you so much for uh, providing the, the bad boy perspective um, in Donald's absence. So appreciate it. All right, and at the zero hour, we got a segment sent in from our buddy Coulter, and um, yeah, let's get his scoop, and maybe he'll uh, be the deciding vote here on pro or negative love cats. Let's see what Coulter has to say. Hey guys, it's Coulter. I just wanted to add my input to the love cats. You know, it's a great song. I think it's a, a song that, you know, it's upbeat. It's something that you can dance to. And in my opinion, I think it would be a good song to start somebody on the band. You know, if you were going to start somewhere, you would probably rather start there than... Unless it's somebody you really know, you know their style, you want to be like, Hey, yeah, I made you this, I don't know, mix, and it has like a hundred years on it, and, you know, just some like random songs, really depressing stuff. It's a good song to get somebody into the band. Uh, It comes from an interesting time period, you know, Japanese Whispers, and then the top after that where you, know, you didn't have Simon Gallup. Uh, you had Phil Thornley, who was the producer of pornography, filling in. I don't know if he actually came up with the bass line on Love Cats or if Andy Anderson, you know, I don't know how much they truly contributed. Different version of Love Cats. There is off the, I think off the vinyl, there's like an extended version that's really just, you know, well, this is obvious, like it's extended, so it's really just the same instrumentation, and they make it longer, or they they add more of one part to a different section, or whatever. And then there is a, uh, and it actually just came out on the second disc of the mixed up deluxe. It's like the TC Benny mix. I don't know why it's called that, and that's one where it's more, it's different. It's like a different ap- approach, different take on the song. Uh, both are good. I can't remember which one I, I like more. But like I said, I, I think it's a good a good song to get somebody into the band. It's probably a good song to hear live. I've only seen The Cure once um, in San Diego during the 2016 tour, and they did not play Love Cats. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they didn't play Love Cats. But uh, it's a great song. It's, you know, it's fun. It's poppy. And... Uh, yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Sweet. Thanks so much, Coulter. Thanks for uh, contributing once again. Always great to hear your thoughts and voice. And uh, yeah, so there you go. Weren't expecting that verdict, did you? I guess Love Cats wins for now. And uh, before we wrap up, though, if you recall, at the top of this episode, we had some young wee little children singing along to Love Cats. That was my kid and my niece, and uh, and they're big fans of the tune. But uh, they're not the only ones, it turns out. So uh, here's a, a quick word from Chaz's little boy and uh, a favorite of youngsters all around the world, I think, Love Cats. And uh, let's hear what he has to say. Hey, Holy Hour Podcast, this is Chaz, and I'm here with... Jonas. And Jonas, you are my... Son. Are you my oldest or youngest? Oldest. How old are you? I'm nine. Nine. And wh- who is who are some of your favorite bands? The Cure. Who else? Um, the Beastie Boys. Who else? He's he's eating a big, big scoop of ice cream right now while he's doing this. Um, Rancid. Okay. Okay. Um, and we're talking about the song "The Love Cats." Now, do you like that song? I love it so much. And why do you like it so much? Um, I like it so much because it's a really, really great song. And I like the details that they put in it. And what are some of your favorite details? Do you, do you like the way he sings? Who, do you like the way that Robert Smith sings the song? 
Yes, I really love it. And do you like that it's very poppy? Yeah. And would you ever play this song for a girl that you like? Maybe. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah? Do you have anything else to add? No. It's just a really great song and I love it. And are we going to go see The Cure when they do their next tour? Definitely. And do you hope that they play that song? Yes. Do you have any other songs you want them to play? And Boys Don't Cry. That's it. All right. Well, thank you for allowing me to interview you. And enjoy your ice cream. You want to say bye? Bye. Say it louder. Bye. And that's it from the Murphy household. Jonas has gone off to watch the computer and some show about Fortnite or Minecraft or whatever a nine-year-old boy's like. Uh, And he likes Secure, so that's cool. And my opinions about the song is pretty much the same as Jonas's. Uh, I think it's a great song. And I hope to play it next time that we go see them, which hopefully should be soon. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Thank you very much, Chaz. Always great to have you on the show, and especially great to have your boy Jonas. Thanks, Jonas, for uh, contributing. And uh, see, everyone, there's hope for the future. The youth is down with a cure, poppy or dark. And, um, yeah, I think I'm on the hook to take my boy to see the cure at this point, too. So uh, they got a tour next year. The, the, the future depends on it. So many young fans ready for it. But, yeah, thanks so much for listening. We're going to wrap it up here. And, uh, you know, we're probably not going to change your mind on a song that came out in 1983 at this point. So uh, take it as you will. Love cats. And, um We'll catch you soon. we got many more great episodes coming up. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Holy Hour Podcast. Drop me a line anytime at GavinConnor at gmail.com, whether you just want to make a comment or uh, contribute in any way. So uh, if you've got something on your mind that's cure-related, uh, write an email or record yourself talking. We'll put it in the episode. We can always work it in. So uh, definitely don't hesitate to uh, be a part of the show. We always love to hear from you. We got some cool stuff around the bend. So stay tuned and uh, we'll catch you soon. Thanks again to Owen, Dub Vulture, and Jonathan for writing in. And again, Chaz and Jonas. And be sure to check out Chaz's shirts that he has for sale. Some very cool Cure shirts over at 17 Seconds shirts.bigcartel.com and uh, special thanks to Coulter again for sharing his thoughts on Love Cats. We'll catch you next time. Talk hard.